This is a 1999 Jaguar XK8 Coupe, and it was a huge deal back when it came out. Jaguar had been selling as its sporty car the XJS since 1975, and it was on sale for 20 years until this came out in the late 1990s and totally changed Jaguar's reputation. I remember just how massive the hype was around this car when it came out back when I was a kid. And today I'm going to review the XK8 and show you all of its quirks and features. Before I get started, big news, this XK8 is for sale, and it's being auctioned live on cars and bins. This is a one-owner XK8. The seller's dad bought it new way back in August of 1999, almost 25 years ago, and it has just over 13,000 miles on it. It's pristine, and you can buy it on cars and bins. So, once you finish watching this video, click the link in the description below to head over to the live auction for this XK8, where you can bid on it and buy it only on cars and bids. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the XK8 with a little explanation of exactly what this car is. Now, like I said, the XK8 replaced the XJS in Jaguar's lineup as sort of their sporty car, and it came out for the 1997 model year. Now, the XJS itself replaced the E-Type in the 1970s, which is almost unfathomable. The car that replaced the Jaguar E-Type was itself replaced in 1997. The XJS lasted for over 20 years on the market before this car finally stepped in to take its place. Now, the replacement car would have come sooner. Jaguar was developing a replacement in the early 1990s, but then Ford took over ownership of both Jaguar and Aston Martin. And for various complicated reasons, they decided to send the Jaguar XJS replacement development project over to Aston Martin, and that became the Aston Martin DB7. That car was intended originally to replace the Jaguar XJS and to be a Jaguar, but at the last minute it was sort of reappropriated as an Aston Martin. And then Ford decided to build the next sporty Jaguar on the DB7 platform. So even though that Jaguar project didn't become a Jaguar, it did eventually give us the XK8 just a little bit later and a little bit different from the original plan. So let's talk through the quirks and features, starting with the fact that the hood is hinged in the front, as you can see, which is certainly unusual. Now, to access the engine compartment, you have a little latch in the driver's footwell, like you do on basically every car. You pull it, but then it unlatches in the back, and all you have to do is lift up the hood, and then you have access to the engine. The engine in this car was a big deal. You can see it says Jaguar V8 on the side, in very large print, and then right below that, you can see it says 4.0. It almost looks like a little decal that was added on later, sort of as an afterthought. Like, hey, we got to tell them it's a 4.0. And so they stuck that on. But this engine really was a big deal. Just like this car was developed ground up as a totally new replacement to the XJS, the same was true of the engine. This was a totally new Jaguar powertrain, 290 horsepower, 4 liter V8, which was a big number back then for a car like this. And in case you wanted more power, soon after the XK8 came out. A couple years later, Jaguar released the high-performance XKR, which also had a V8, but it had a supercharger for even more power. Interestingly, the supercharger came straight off the Ford F-150 SVT Lightning, which is probably the least Jaguar XK8-ish car I can imagine, but it was in Ford's portfolio. They had a supercharger, so they figured, stick it on and get the power. Now, in terms of powertrain, one other thing I loved about these old-school XK8 models is on the badge on the hood. You can see it has Jaguar and the cat logo, but at the bottom it says 4 liter. Sort of an old-school touch bragging about the engine size on the badge, as if the engine is just as important as the manufacturer of this car. But anyway, next we go to move inside the XK8, and even the key to this car was a quirk. Jaguar keys from this area had this sort of 
cylindrical shape to them, very different from every other car key you've ever seen, but it was distinctively Jaguar and frankly kind of cool. I think Aston Martin also used keys like this under Ford ownership, at least for a time, but you also had it in the XK8. Anyway, open up the door and you're greeted by a door sill that says Jaguar XK8, reminding you precisely what your car is. And also you have a floor mat that says the same thing. This has to be the nicest condition Jaguar XK8 floor mat left in existence. This car has barely been driven and it's nice to see a lot of stuff in better shape than you'd normally find on XK8s. Now, interestingly, despite Ford ownership of Jaguar, when this car came out, there's not all that much in this car that is shared with Ford, at least not stuff I can easily and quickly tell. The power window switches are clearly shared with Ford models from this era. And strangely enough, the control to operate the power steering column is a Ford part, but that's a power mirror switch in other Ford models. That is the power mirror switch in my Ford GT repurposed here to control the power steering column. Strangely enough, this car has a completely different actual power mirror control, not a Ford. <laughs> <laughs> they use Ford's power mirror control, but not to control the power mirrors. Other than that, I don't actually see all that much Ford in this car. The turn signal stock is shared with Aston Martin models of this time. Same deal with the wiper stock, and I think a few other controls here or there, some Aston Martin stuff, but a lot of that wasn't shared with Ford, and there's surprisingly little parts sharing, despite the fact that Ford owned these brands, which might be one of the reasons why <laughs> Ford lost a ton of money on these brands. And indeed, without a lot of stuff shared with Ford in this car, there are some rather unusual controls in here. Like, for example, the parking brake is between the driver's seat and the driver's door. You can see it right here. A lot of exotic cars had their parking brakes in this location, but it wasn't particularly common on more normal cars like this, but the XK8 has the brake there. And the operation is a little unusual. If you want to put the parking brake on, you pull it up, you can hear it clicking, and then you push it down because you didn't want it to get in the way of you getting in and out of the car. To release the parking brake, you pull it up again, press the button at the end, and then push it down, and that releases it. So the parking brake in this car can be on but down, which is a little counterintuitive, but that's how it works. Next up, another interesting control in this car is this little circle of buttons next to the gauge cluster. These little buttons control what's on the gauge cluster. On the left half of this circle, you have a button marked clear, which clears any warnings. Like if it's telling you a door is open, you can clear it and it'll go away. The other half of this circle is taken up by different buttons that are sized depending on their importance. So 0, 0 will zero out the trip odometer. A slash B switches between trip odometers. And miles kilometer, you're not going to use that all that often, switches between miles kilometers, obviously. And that is the smallest button of all, a little circle of gauge cluster controls. Next up, another rather unusual control in this car is the button for sport mode. It's mounted not near the steering wheel, but in the center console. It has an S. You push it, and then a little light turns on on the button, letting you know you're in sport mode. Nothing changes in the gauge cluster. Now, next to the S button, you have this little odometer icon. That turns on your cruise control. Strangely enough, all of the rest of the cruise controls are on the steering wheel. You can see here, set, cancel, resume, but the on-off button is in the center console next to the shift lever. Nowhere near anything else. And next up, here's another weird one. To the left of the steering wheel, you have a square button marked valet. You press that and the car goes into valet mode and then you can't open the trunk. You have locked the valet out from opening the trunk. The only problem is you press it again and well, it doesn't turn it off. You press it all the times you want and it just stays in valet mode. You can't do anything about it. Indeed, this car only will go out of valet mode if you get outside and manually lock and unlock the driver's door using the main key to the car. Only then are you out of valet mode. That prevents the valet from accessing your trunk valuables. As for the buttons in the center control stack, there are quite a few, as you can see. I counted 42 individual buttons in here, plus two dials. <laughs> There's a lot of controls. And every time I hear somebody tell me that cars shouldn't have screens, I think about this and how many more buttons a modern car would have with so many more features, it would look pretty crazy in here. So this is all buttons in the pre-screen era. And there are a couple of interesting ones in here. For example, this button marked EXT, you push that, 
set. And then the climate control display will show the exterior temperature. Instead of showing the interior climate temperature, it'll temporarily switch to show you the temperature outside the car. Also unusual in this 42 button array, the traction control off button is massive. As you can see, it's right here closest to the driver and it's huge. It is bigger than any of your radio preset buttons and it is bigger than the climate control temperature button, even though nobody buying this car will ever turn off the traction control. The button is there and it is massive. Also unusual in this interior is the shifter situation. All of these XK8 models, at least the ones sold in North America, came with a five-speed automatic transmission, which was actually pretty advanced at the time. Most cars, even luxury cars, were still using four speeds, but not the XK8. The weird thing was the shifter pattern. It looks like a J. They called it the J gate, and yes, J stood for Jaguar. Now, this car came out in a period where automatic transmissions that could be manually shifted were starting to become popular. The sort of Tiptronics, where you could put it in manual mode and then upshift and downshift. Jaguar decided to buck the trend. In this car, you could shift it manually, but you would go through individual gears. You can see on the left side, two, three, four, and then put it in D to access the fifth forward gear. You were supposed to actually shift into the gears if you wanted to manually shift your automatic transmission. It was bizarre. Nobody did it, but that's what they offered. The J-Gate with the manual shift mode. Now, also worth pointing out in the center console, you do have cup holders here. You push this button and a lid unfurls for cup holders. And directly in front of that, you have an ashtray. You push down on this panel and an ashtray opens up. But most of the time, they are concealed under nice leather. And in fact, the interior of this car is pretty nice. Even by modern standards, you got a lot of leather and fine wood in here. Everything looks nice and luxurious. Not as much cheap plastic as you might expect, especially for a 90s car. That was sort of the thing of the 90s, throwing cheap plastic into vehicles, but this is mostly leather, wood. It looks nice in here. This was a big deal car for Jaguar, and so they made it a big deal in the interior. As for the gauges, these are very straightforward, as you can see. Nothing fancy or cool or special fonts in here. Just very simple, straightforward gauges. These may be from a Ford model, although I can't quite place which one. Not sure if it came from the Mustang from this era, or maybe they were unique to the Jaguar, but simple, basic gauges. Now, one interesting thing about them is if you have some fault, the car will tell you by displaying a little red line that would draw your attention to the fault, and then there was a little pixel display that would explain what the fault was. So you'd be driving along, you'd see the red line, it would get your attention, and then you would look further to see the fault. We have come a long way since this. In just 20 plus years, we now have giant full screen gauge clusters that can show you a 3D virtual map of where you are, a long way from a red line and a pixelated display. Now, of all of the stuff I just mentioned, the interesting interior quirks and features, quite possibly the quirkiest feature of the interior is that this car has back seats. Although, as you can see, they are tremendously small, almost laughably tiny back seats, but they are there. You fold the front seat forward, and then you get decent space to climb in, but if you're taller than a small child, there's no way you can put the front seat in any configuration that will make any Anybody comfortable, but back seats do exist in this car for added practicality, the occasional time you want to drive four people around, or for some extra storage if you want to throw stuff back there. But anyway, next up on the outside of the XK8, I'm going to get into the trunk, which is in fact a trunk. Press a button on the key fob, pop it open, and the trunk lid lifts open. I say that because this car kind of looks like it might be a hatchback, and other similar cars often are, but this one isn't. It has a true trunk and the sloping rear window is fixed in place. Now, you get into this trunk and you can see it's relatively large in size, not exactly huge given the big luxury coupe persona of this car, but it's big enough for stuff, including those all important golf clubs. You do have a couple interesting things in here. You lift up the floor and you can see a full size spare and another wheel. So these cars shipped with five wheels, which surely added to the cost, but that's what you want from your luxury car instead of some bright red temporary tire spare. You also have a six disc CD changer back here because that was the height of luxury in the late 1990s, a six CD player instead of that awful single CD thing that some people had on their 
lesser cars. But anyway, let's talk XK8 exterior. A couple of interesting things. For one, these were offered as a coupe or as a convertible. The coupe models are much harder to find. The convertibles were more popular. It seemed to go along with sort of the ethos of the car, like the Mercedes-Benz SL, which was only offered as a convertible. But here you could get a coupe, but not that many people did. And especially all these years later, the convertible seems like they've been more frequently preserved. People bought them as weekend cars, barely drove them. The coupes are just harder to find. This one, obviously a coupe, and again, just not all that common. Now, in terms of the design, it's a little opinion splitting. Obviously, you can see long, flowy car with curvy lines like a lot of 90s cars had. This is certainly emblematic of its era of car design, but frankly, I think it's aged relatively well. Now, I don't want to say that it looks modern and timeless because it doesn't. It definitely looks like a 90s car, but in kind of a cool way. It looks like one of the more beautiful 90s cars, one of the more attractive and distinctive cars to employ the sort of flowy line, jelly bean circle shape that so many cars had in the 90s. Now, personally, I prefer the look of the coupe to the convertible. For one thing, you see it less often, like I mentioned, but also the convertible is a little weird in that when the top is down, the top sort of sticks up a little bit around the back. Like it doesn't go all the way fully down, as you can see. And I've never loved that look. The coupe just has a more beautiful, more complete design in my mind. It's just harder to come by. But coupe or convertible, didn't matter which one you got in the late 90s, these were all tremendously special cars. I cannot explain to you how massive the hype was around the XK8 when it first came out in 1997. It was on the cover of every single car magazine. It was a massive deal. There were toys. I, as a 10-year-old boy, had a scale model of a Jaguar XK8. This was used in a James Bond movie. Everybody knew about the new Jag. It was the hottest car on the market. This was back before SUVs took off, when people still cared about two-door cars. This thing was the biggest deal on the planet, especially since it was replacing the XJS after such a long run. Finally, a fresh sports car from Jaguar, totally new design, totally new engine. It was a massive, massive important special car back then. And clearly the seller of this car knew that, or at least his dad who bought the car new back in 1999 and kept it all these years. It was the coolest car on the road, at least for a while there. All right, driving the XK8. I'm actually a little anxious to drive this car because it has only 13,000 miles in 25 years, and I kind of feel like adding more miles is not really what I want to be doing. It's just so nice. You know, so many of these cars were bought to drive and were driven or just weren't kept up all that well because they went to their second owner, then the third owner, then their fourth owner, and their fifth owner who bought it for six grand on Craigslist. And so they didn't care. But like this car being a one owner, like never really driven, it was always maintained by someone who obviously had enough money to buy it in the first place. And so that kept it pretty nice. And then it just didn't get all that much use. And so yeah, I, these are the cars I like filming the most, filming videos with the most because they're they're so nice. They're so such good examples of what the car was when it came off the factory floor, but also they can <laughs> be a little nervous to drive. Okay, so this XK8, now I've already said this like twice in this video, but the hype around this car was just massive when I was a kid. And I've always wanted to do a video on one, but I've, I, I really wanted to shoot an XKR coupe, but it's just so hard to find nice ones. I've, I settled for an XK8 coupe. I really didn't want to shoot a convertible. They're just a lot more common. The coupes had this sort of, you know, flowy design that was to me more, less generic, more interesting, more unusual, more exotic, frankly. And I think the coupes are just so rare they've aged well. Now, the first thing I noticed driving around in this car is it's not a sports car. You know, I refer to this as like the sporty Jag, the sporty model in Jag's lineup, even like the sporty sports car in Jag's lineup, but this isn't like a sports car in the traditional sense. Uh, no manual transmission, and it's also just a big, long, luxury coupe, like or convertible, if you will. These were not intended, they were sportier by Jaguar standards, but they were not intended to be like high performance sports cars. And that becomes incredibly obvious the moment you start to turn where you discover 
The steering is radically over-assisted. You know, luxury cars from the late 90s, they like discovered power steering and then just heavily over-boosted everything so you can literally steer the car with your pinky, which isn't what you want in a sports car, but it probably is what you want in like a big touring car like this. But the other reason that this is so clearly not a sports car is that when you go around corners, I mean, you're met with like body roll from a soft, wallowy suspension. Again, that's probably what people wanted who bought this car. It was a luxury car Jaguar. Older people were buying them, but it is a soft and wallowy car. It is definitely not like a throw it around corners and get precise steering feel, feel and feedback kind of vehicle. That is not the situation here. Now, that is not to say that this isn't a good car. In fact, quite the opposite. I think this car is pretty perfect at what it's supposed to be, which is like a luxury smooth grand tourer. This automatic transmission is not fast or exciting or fun, but it is silky smooth. You barely feel the upshifts, which is something that I associate with like modern dual clutch automatic transmissions. But here we are in like an old school torque converter and it's just so soft and comfortable, just like the ride. And this V8 was not exactly like a peaky, powerful sports car engine, but it was a big, smooth, torquey engine. You put your foot in it, you were supported by a lot of power. You didn't have to work to go get the power. It was always there and always available. This was a cruiser, plain and simple. You cruised around in this car. You just drove and wafted and you had a really cool looking car that everybody respected, especially back then, late 90s. This was the coolest thing on the road. And you just kind of drove around in like luxury and comfort. And you had the knowledge that you were driving this like big baller car. It couldn't win a drag race against a lot of stuff, but that wasn't, you didn't need to prove anything to anybody if you had an XK8 in the late 90s. Ultimately, this car is just plain cool. Again, it's not the fastest, it's not the most fun, but it's cool. And I really think the design is aging in a way that it isn't necessarily the most beautiful, but it is like emblematic of this era. Like this car feels like, oh, some big 90s baller, like some old money, like just had the car for years type of situation. That's what this car kind of looks like. It's definitely not the hottest, not the point your finger and stare kind of car, but you know, it's still special and it's still cool. And especially this one, because it is just so nice and so shockingly clean. And I just cannot believe <laughs> that it's in this condition. And now I have to go return it and not put any more miles on it because I don't want to screw anything up. And so that's the 1999 Jaguar XK8. This car was a massive deal back when it came out 25 years ago. And although it's not as advanced or amazing today, it's still a special and interesting car and surprisingly beautiful after all these years. Anyway, now it's time to give the XK8 a Doug score. And the Doug score is here, 49 out of 100, placing it last among this group of similar cars, although none of these cars are really that similar to the XK8 except for the Mercedes SL, and nearly all of them are newer. The XK8 was in a weird league of its own in the late 90s, a big luxury cruiser without a major emphasis on sport, but instead on style and elegance, and that design has stayed remarkably appealing today. It's not especially fast, but it's smooth and fun and cool, particularly for the money.